Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a follow up conversation to uh, another group that met to talk about their experience coming across the border as uh, as a non Canadian citizen in, in that group. Uh, it was mostly through the lens of US citizenship. Uh, so a US citizen entering into Canada. Um, but this is an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the experience of uh, Terence and Brenda who are both Canadians and are bringing with them uh, spouses and families and so on that are not Canadian. So we're just going to uh, kind of zero in on that uh, aspect of it a little bit. And just a reminder, uh, I'm Al Postma. I live in Brantford, Ontario. I pastored a church in Thunder Bay before this. I work in pastor church resources. And this is just a way that uh, pastor church resources can help resource pastors and churches as um you know something as as practical as uh crossing the border uh so i'm gonna just kind of work my way down the screen and terence you're up so i'll just let you introduce yourself where you're at and a short version of your immigration story hey uh my name is terence visser and in uh, August of 2019, uh, my family and I made our way to Edmonton, Alberta, where I'm now serving at Maranatha CRC. Um, before that, I was serving a church in Ohio in a small community called Willard. And uh, uh, in, I believe it was March, maybe even April, I received uh, a call letter after uh, conversations with Maranatha. I received a call letter and I accepted a call. Now, something that was unique about uh, our situation is that- Can I pause for a sec? When you say like March or April, just to locate ourselves again, we are in October of 2020. So I'm assuming you're talking about March, April, 2020. No, uh, 2019. 2019, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, over over uh, a year ago, this is all ancient history, not really. Uh, so yeah, in 2019, I received a call in roughly April, and I accepted the call. And I had a sabbatical that was planned pre-call for that particular summer. And the church, uh, that particular church did not have any requirements that I had to stay after my sabbatical and after numerous conversations, uh, they said to me, uh, we want you to take the sabbatical, even though you will be moving. Um, at the time, I thought that was a good thing, but it, it created, uh, it was good, but it did create some challenges related to immigrating. So we started the immigration process uh, before the sabbatical, but um, as anyone knows who has begun to fill out these forms, they are uh, long and there are uh, many documents that you have to find, uh, like you need a, like background checks, you need, um, like for our children, they need to photo IDs. And it was very cumbersome. Uh, so long story short, we were not at a place uh, um, where uh, you know, we were not able to apply for our, uh, so for Laura, she needed to apply for permanent residency. And our children had to apply for proof of citizenship because they were my children born to a Canadian. They have it, but they have no proof of it. So we were not able to get those applications off before we moved. And honestly, I'm not sure how realistic it is even to get that stuff off before. But if possible, it is good to be able to get it off. You can apply from outside or within uh, the country. Um, so... Uh, that was uh, our experience uh, sort of leading up to it. We're on sabbatical. It's in the back of my mind. We get back from sabbatical. We have three weeks roughly to get ready. And uh, I got as much done as possible. I contacted the uh, numerous people, said, contact the border where you'll be crossing. Find out the name of the officer who will be present um, or will be on shift when you're crossing. And that's what I did. I contacted uh, um, the uh, Canadian side and um, uh, and I knew he was on. Uh, so August 8 was the day we crossed and he was there until 11 p.m. Unfortunately for us, 
uh, so part of immigrating, which you would have covered with the other group, is you have to export everything. And we had two vehicles and a camper and two things we still had a loan on. And you have to visit the US side before, right, to export things. And Michigan and Ohio have two different ways in which they, uh, um, so if you have a loan in Ohio, they will not give you the original title. They give you a certified copy. In Michigan, they give you the original title. And crossing Michigan, they said, you cannot cross because you do not have the actual title. And I said, Ohio doesn't do that. And more or less, he said, too bad. And I said, what should I do? He said, maybe go try crossing in Buffalo, which is so from Windsor, uh, Detroit, Windsor, go, go try Buffalo, which was ridiculous because the moving truck was on its way, a semi full of our possessions. And finally, thankfully, there was somebody in the background at the office that, hey, by the way, Ohio does this differently than Michigan. And but that was after a fairly lengthy time. And because of that, we got to Canada after 11 p.m. And they were not happy with me uh, because we had not applied for permanent residency and proof of citizenship while still in the U.S. And so, uh, it, yeah, it was about three in the morning when we finally left the, uh, um, the uh, crossing, uh, the Cane side, and we made our way to McDonald's, got baked goods, did not know that McDonald's sold baked goods. In Canada, they do. So, and then we made our way to a Walmart parking lot and slept. But um, yeah, and so all in all, I think we arrived at the border roughly eight o'clock in the evening, maybe it was between eight and nine. And, and we were finally done at about, yeah, it was between two and two and three o'clock. And from that point on, we've been in the process of applying. We, uh, because of COVID, things are taking longer than they should. And we are, so 2019, August, we crossed Laura's visitor visa. And that's, and that's the kicker. When you come across, I, I believe technically they only need to give you a six month visitor visa. They did give Laura a one-year visitor visa. They gave our children a two-year visitor visa. But because of delays and one mistake on my part in the application process, um, she still has not been processed yet. And we had to actually extend her visa, which was another application. And now finally, uh, about three weeks ago, so we are in, uh, yes, it, I guess it was in late September, so a year and just over a month after we crossed, they finally started processing her papers, which is huge uh, because come November, she would have, uh, Alberta Health would no longer have covered her health insurance. So it's just, honestly, it's been a super uh, stressful year and um, it's very cumbersome. And at the time I found a consultant uh, who would do the work for about $3,000. And I thought, you know what? That actually doesn't sound too bad. Uh, the church sort of freaked out when I suggested maybe that we look into this. Um, but now a year into this, $3,000 is nothing. The time, the energy that has gone into this, and Laura still can't work, Right, so it uh, being a dual income family, it it has a long term impact on us, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been very challenging. I will not lie. I don't. I I. If anyone are in our situation, where because um, I've had a lot of conversations with people who have come across as U.S. citizens, and their process is easier. Like initially, just to get here to get work, that is easier than our process. Um, it's just, yeah, even things like our children needed photo ID and we ended up having to pay roughly $800 to get them passports because the $20 photo IDs that we got in Ohio before coming got lost in the mail. Well, as I found out, they were just sitting in my former church's office and they had not been forwarded like all the other mail because it's government mail and the church just hung on to it. So yeah, it's, you know, we're, the church has covered half the cost for Laura's permanent residency. We are paying for our children's uh, proof of citizenship. And so we are in this, you know, 600, 800, 
um, yeah, so roughly what, 1200 plus uh, 800, so roughly $2,000 of our own. So yeah, $3,000 now seems like a, a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. Cause I believe that covered the applications. Does, this sound, does that sound right, Brenda? Um, I think it's 1200 for an application as permanent residency. And I think it's about a hundred dollars for the application um, as a child. Um, so we okay. only have one child. Um, so that makes a difference. So like for the consultant to do it, you mean? No, we did everything ourselves. But oh, you did, have, okay. Um, so I'm thinking thing. that I'm thinking that the consultant would have charged three thousand dollars, and that included the application fees. But I could be wrong. That would be something to look into. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. and Brenda, you are in the middle of it as we speak and as we record this. Sorry, we're in the middle of also having a child. Anyways, um, oh, that's fine. So, yeah, my story is a little bit different than Terrence's in the sense that um, um, I'm a campus minister. I'm currently a campus minister at Michigan State, and I'm also a campus minister at the moment at the University of Toronto. Because of COVID, everything is online, and so I'm actually splitting my time between the two of them. So I've hmm. actually been working for two and a half months um, for both of them. So I actually have paychecks waiting for me when we arrive in Canada because I don't That's currently good. have a bank account. So they're just sitting there. Um, but yeah, so I was in conversation with the ministry um, back in February. The applications were due in April. COVID hit in March. So this is 2020. Um, they um, offered me the position, um, I think, middle of June or so. Um, I accepted um, as a campus minister. I'm called as a pastor, but I also accept position. So it's a little bit different. Um, but anyway, so June, I knew we were moving and we had to actually physically sell our house. Um, and then we actually had to be there. But because of the pandemic, all of this happened online. And so we have not been to Toronto yet, even though we're going to move there. Um, mm -hmm. God has been very gracious. So we have a place to live thanks to actually the pandemic because another church is empty and you can't get a pastor because it's hard to get somebody when they're not sure if they can move. But our process, thankfully, has been um, a little bit less complicated than Terrence's, but also more complicated. Um, but it's more complicated because of the pandemic um, and less so because of our situation. We have been, um, we've had the gift or the challenge of having done green cards and permanent residency actually on the American side. So we're familiar with some of the paperwork issues um, and actually had um, a lawyer help us through some of those things well, each time. Um, to varying degrees of success. Um, and the better the lawyer, or actually the more competent the lawyer, not necessarily the more expensive the lawyer, um, yeah. the better it is. But hmm. they have to know what they're doing. Um, and I don't know if it's different in Canada. Um, we actually had an immigration lawyer um, who's chair of our my board. And so he acted as a consultant. So we filled out all the paperwork and then we just asked him for help. And he said, this is great. I don't want to be your official lawyer because it gets complicated with my work, but he will tell us. So that made an enormous difference. So we have our permanent residence papers. We've applied for Canadian, Canadian proof of citizenship, my daughter, and away we go. So we are hoping that things will go okay, but it's really kind of complicated to move in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about specifically around uh, the fact that you have a non-Canadian spouse, how did that impact things? I mean, you didn't need to get a, you know, work permit or visa or anything like that for yourself to come. Um, were they, are they able to just come? Like, I know for, if you're the pastor, like if you're the primary person coming in and the reason you're coming is for your work, uh, you would need to have that all in order, but I don't know about the, the process. I don't know how it works when the person who's coming alongside is not coming necessarily with a job. Like Terrence, you said, your, your wife does not have a job. So if she's not coming on her own work permit. How does that work? Is there anything that you would want someone to know who is Canadian, who has a, a, a non-Canadian spouse coming in? Um. 
Yeah, I, I'll, go, I'll go first. Unless you want to go, Brenda. No. Um, the uh, So the nice thing is she's automatically, so Laura it was automatically given a visitor's visa. So mm -hmm. in some sense, it's easier. Uh, you can actually cross the border without, like in our situation, because we had not sent any applications in yet, she was able to cross the border with no, uh, without having done any paperwork ahead of time, right? Because I'm basically reestablishing residency in Canada and there's some paperwork that goes with that. Um, what anyone going through this needs to know is when, so she, Laura has to, so there's no other way for Laura to stay in Canada other than getting permanent residence status. Right. There's not a type of visa she can apply for. Uh, she has to apply for permanent residency, which is a more complicated process than applying for, for uh, a visa, because ultimately that leads to citizenship, right? You get your permanent residency and then eventually your citizenship. So it's a more cumbersome process. And when you get that stuff filled out is, 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 uh, is just really important, right? Because as long as uh, like I said earlier, Laura is guaranteed, I believe it's a six month visitor's visa, which that's a really small window, like under normal times, like non, not, you know, when it's not a global pandemic, I think they say six or uh, I want eight to 10 months, maybe to process permanent residency. So you really, you're under the, the gun right from, right from the beginning. So that's what I would say is it's so important to understand that it's more complicated and it's very time sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were given an advice for Matthias to apply probably as early as he wanted to, although we were also told um, that there were two processes that you could apply from outside the country, but you could also apply from inside the country and that the time it would take would be a little bit different and there's different freedom that you would have and so on. Um, so just different things like that. But it's been really great to have somebody we can just check in like, okay, what about this? What about this? Like, how do we do this? Like, I, I think we email them like once a week. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so that's what it's felt like. Um, Brenda, I'm curious. So have you guys decided, uh, what is your husband's name? Sorry, my husband's name is Matthias. Matthias? He's a Dutch. Um, he's a Dutch citizen um, and just Dutch. So that okay. makes it complicated. So does he, is he applying for permanent residency uh, from outside the country or are you guys waiting until you are in the country? We have already applied. So we have our applications in. We sent it in about a month ago, maybe two months ago. Um, and the same thing is with Lydia. We, I think applied, I think June the 1st for Lydia. That's our daughter. Um, and it's just... There's no confirmation, anything. I mean, it's been a pandemic, but I don't think they're particularly great about confirmations either. Like we contact no. them periodically, like, hey, did you get our paperwork? And they're like, we'll let you know when we do, we process it. And I'm like, thanks, that's not helpful when you're crossing a border, whatever. Mm -hmm. it's so Americans hard. are very different. Cause they like, you send in your form and like within two weeks you get this like pretty little I-7797 form that says we received all of it. Don't ask us again for six months. Mm. Yeah, actually, I, as I, I went through the U.S. citizenship application process right before we came. In fact, I became a U.S. citizen the day before we moved to Canada. So I had my citizenship ceremony. Um, and yeah, I, I would say the U.S. is a little bit better with regards to letting you know once they perceive the application. Because we, mm -hmm. we literally went six months without hearing a single word on Laura's application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I'm just, I'm trying to imagine myself as a non-Canadian spouse uh, coming into Canada with my spouse who's a pastor. So some of the things that really stand out to me is for one, you can apply before or after you enter Canada that as a spouse of a Canadian citizen, I'm, it sounds like I'm automatically granted a, at least a six month visitor visa to come in. I don't have to worry about not getting that that uh, you have to uh, do something to establish or reestablish your residency in Canada. Uh, and the clock is ticking on the permanent residency thing. And I can't try to get like a visa to, to work at 
a position here where I live, it has to be because I'm coming in with a Canadian spouse, it has to be permanent residency. Correct. And you can apply, if you apply for permanent residency, you can apply for a work permit with that. And oh, okay. That generally come, I, I was, so there's a, a, a couple here. She is Canadian. He is American. And they went through the process uh, about a year prior to us coming. And his work permit came a week after they approved his permanent residency. So it's, <laughs> you know, I, I was also going to say the kids too, right? The kids also need a visa. Um, so mm. the way they're, they're treated the same way that the spouses, uh, in my experience, they gave our kids a two-year visa, whereas Laura only received a one-year. Okay. And that visitor visa basically is sort of an allowance to give you the time to get your other paperwork in yep. place. Yep. Okay. And, and your, your, you know, you receive right, uh, like healthcare, you receive healthcare, but mm -hmm. like Laura cannot get a, an Alberta license yet. Right. So there's mm -hmm. some things that you uh, have to wait for. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, anything else that kind of stands out to you as uh, recognizing there's a whole lot of other information we talked about in the other one, um, yeah. but for the, the spousal piece particularly, or anything you want to add uh, based on what you saw from the previous video. I did not watch the whole, the whole oh, video. Um, I watched, I just watched a few pieces. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, I would say this, 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 this surprised me. Um, and I felt this before with churches. I, I, I think of, uh, you know, when I became a minister in the Christian Reformed Church, I, I became a minister within this, this broad organization of which there are many different, you know, local, uh, um, you know, churches that are part of it. Um, but I have felt, and I think this can, this tends to happen uh, at the local level. So there might be very different experiences in different churches. But my feeling is that when I start talking about to another church, there's a sense in which I'm, I'm talking to the competition. And, and that, uh, you know, there's this you know, there's not, when, when the church hears that you're leaving, there, there's a, there's a sense in which, you know, we're okay. You know, you're gone. You're not our responsibility anymore. And so on that end, mm. there's just, you know, now hindsight, I would very much lead the, the process of saying goodbye. Right. I, I've realized that as a minister, that's something that that's a, that's a, becomes a part of, needs to be part of my ministry. Um, and then on the other end of things, there's a sense in which, you know, we don't want to, uh, you know, what is our responsibility for you uh, once you're done there? And now I've realized that the church order does address that. Um, so I guess my surprise is that there's not more information readily available, even when a church is in the process of calling that information isn't automatically sent. Hey, just a reminder, these are your, these are your obligations, right? This is not something that you can choose. Uh because now what I've realized is I've had to be my number one advocate and, and I, that's not a comfortable place to be in. It's hard to end well. It's hard to begin well. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are having to sort of, you know, advocate for yourself saying, Hey, look, this is a very cumbersome, lengthy, costly process. Right. And, and I think that it, and I, I was like, so I was looking for somebody who went through my experience and it was hard. And I finally found, so Bob DeMoor uh, was um, pr providing pulpit supply here and his son had gone through a similar experience. Um, his son is now Professor Kings and about a decade ago or even more, his son had gone through the same process. And of course, you know, we tend to forget things in 10 years. So it's not like he could give a, a play by play account of, of the process he went through. And, so, you know, and I called Pastor Church uh, relation I, I can't I guess I, I think I, I probably contacted pastor church resources looking for stuff I was just really disappointed at the lack of information mm -hmm. it, it, we are a binational church and there is a total vacuum when it comes to helpful information and so you know I'm I'm av I'm fighting for myself in all the all these different fronts and trying to find out all this information and it's super stressful 
And, and I, we had a, a gathering last week with pastors who are their second call. And there's this, this idea that sometimes in our second call, we sort of coast along. And I thought, you know how I arrived at my second call? I, I felt like I was a washed up whale. You know, I was hmm. just utterly, and then you're, you're jumping into ministry. So yeah, I, I think that the denomination has a responsibility to care for its ministers. And this seems like a really obvious way to, to do that. Like in my classes, there's so many of us who are U.S. Uh, from the U.S. It's not mm-hmm. like this is a uh, an uncommon situation. So, yeah, I was surprised by that. The lack of resources and the lack of uh, the, the that that no one has been really proactive. That I had to do so much uh, on my own. Mm-hmm. Brenda, anything you want to add? I would say that. Um... Yeah, like there are many of us who have done this, and yet there are a lot of us who have not done this, and a lot of churches who have not experienced it. And so I feel like um, I've been really, yeah, gifted in the sense that there I've been around um, in classes Toronto, it seems like this is not unusual. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's an awareness of some of the challenges, and that's been really a gift. Um, and I think, you know, actually having immigration lawyers and stuff like that connected to the ministry, they know that it's a challenge, so they've provided extra financial things and stuff like that, just to say, hey, we know there are costs involved. Um, we want to help you out with those. Um, and yeah, it, it, is, it is just deeply comforting to hear from other people um, who've gone through the experience and to know that mm-hmm. like 25 different questions I'm going through, um, but those are normal and maybe you have answers for them. Um, and I know that like after going through my own experience in the US, I was like, well, I'd be happy to help people. I know this is like really rough, right? Like, um, and we didn't know anything as a ministry. Um, yeah, and it's funny mm-hmm. because I became the expert in my own paperwork and stuff like that. Um, in fact, I actually knew more than some of the lawyers I felt like other people were talking to simply because it's such a weird process, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's like you become your advocate. And so you have to, um, I think, yeah, you have to, be a little bit of kind of a little bit of like not maybe type a but kind of like really close to details yeah. for that to be okay so if you and your partner or your partner are not that type of people you really need a couple of people like that who are on your team in the church yeah. um because the first time i did it like the, going into the states the person who was doing it for me on like the ministry side wasn't that type of person and it was really stressing me out Mm-hmm. And the next time it's just like, well, I did it and it was kind of stressful, but it was okay, right? Like, whatever, it's paperwork. Um, mm-hmm. I do my taxes kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and I think just simply to have people who can support you. And then also, I do have to say that moving in a pandemic just seems like a whole nother level of stress. So yeah. if you are not absolutely mm-hmm. convinced that God is calling you and calling you both to this ministry and to like to a new ministry, stay home. Like, just, just don't do it, right? And I guess... Um, I think I feel like you have to have a, a stronger sense of call if you're going to cross the border because it's going to be extra hard. And I think the church, mm. I think Terrence, you had said this previously that the church has to realize there's going to be extra costs involved, but there's also going to be extra costs for the minister, just the stress level that we're going to potentially go through, and to be able to to recognize these things. Yeah, but it's also. On my end, it's been an opportunity to receive grace. Like I get to live in a personage of another church simply because um, because of the pandemic and because their ministers didn't, they couldn't get a minister and they're still in the process. They're in the process of restarting a call. So for six months, we have a place to land. Um, we'll be figure out where we're going to live permanently. So, I mean, it's also an opportunity for grace and God to work. Yeah. Hey, um, if I could add one more thing, I, I wonder if, you know, there, there are shifts. And one of the shifts that we're seeing is pastors staying in a church for longer. And it just so happens that my last church and this church both had a minister for, I think the last one, he was there for roughly 16 years. The one who was here before me was here for 19 years. And both churches acknowledge that they're a little bit rusty on the whole calling process. And I wonder if, you know, when pastors move much more frequently, everyone was just a little more up on this type of stuff. And and I think that's just something that we need to be more aware of. Churches are mm-hmm. rusty and 
you know, uh, they don't necessarily know where to look for information. They don't know necessarily the right questions to be asking. And I think that's, that's very much my experience. Mm -hmm. so. And the governments have probably been a little bit more like careful about things. So I think the process has also gotten more complicated in the last 10 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Things have, yeah, there are multiple things that have changed. Yeah. So it's gotten more complicated and we're, we're worse at it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, That's a I great combination. <laughs> no, no. Uh, hey, I, I'm just going to pull this to a close. I just want to thank you. Um, I know both of you sort of indicated, yeah, it, it just felt like you were alone and had to be your own advocate and, and sort some of this out. Uh, our real hope is that doing some of these videos and pulling together uh, some of the resources. It's just another simple way. Uh, it, it seems simple to do. This wasn't that complicated to pull together. And yet uh, we know that it can be a huge blessing to people who are looking at this sort of uh, cross-border experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't wanna do this, but I will anyway. I just wanna end with a disclaimer that it is October, 2020. And this is the experience of Terrence and Brenda and uh, if you are watching this video and you are looking to cross the border, uh, taking a call and uh, you have a spouse who's not Canadian and you're entering Canada, uh, you just heard, um, what do they say in some context? For entertainment purposes only or something like that. Uh, this isn't legal advice. Uh, Terrence and Brenda share their experience freely with the expectation that uh, whoever's watching this video is going to do their own due diligence to make sure that you're following whatever the current immigration law states, um, because things can change. Uh, they change all the time. So uh, just an encouragement for anyone watching this. But it also sounds like it's doable. They're doing it. Others have done it. Others will do it. And it's a way that we can serve in the church together. So I just want to thank you. Do you want to say a party word, Terrence? I just want I just exactly. wanted to add, say yes it is very doable it mm -hmm. is very doable cool all right well thank you and uh, I'm gonna hit the stop recording.